I've been Yale's University Information Security Officer since 1997, and when I first took the job, I thought it was primarily going to be matching wits against you know hackers out on the internet and things like that. Um, and then I quickly learned that it involves people, and <laughs> a lot of time it involves people who would call up and you know they would say that they thought somebody else was reading their email, and I would say, well, why do you think that? And they would say, well, because my email's gone, or you know, somebody's sending out emails me, and I'd say, well, do you have an idea who you think it is? And they'd say, oh yeah, I think it's my family member X, you know, whatever. And I'd say, well, why do you think it's them? And they'd say, oh, because I gave them my password. And I'd say, well, did you change your password? And they'd say, yes. And I'd say, okay, well, that, that's good. Um, you know, but it just kind of brought me down to earth. Uh, starting in the early 2000s, I began to get much more involved with the, the medical side of things. The medical school had their own IT department and they set up their own information security office uh, starting around 2000 in the Y2K days in, in preparation for HIPAA uh, privacy in 2003 and then HIPAA security in 2005. Um, now on main campus we were involved with that and in 2005 also both sides of campus, both IT organizations were merged and I took over the uh, medical school's information security office at that time. But even more than that, increasingly, a lot of what we've been doing it does not necessarily always involve security, but it often involves compliance. So a lot of our function has really been switched over. I'd say 50% is now IT compliance. And IT compliance is not always necessarily security. Security is there primarily in support of privacy, confidentiality, um, but also in support of integrity and availability, which are, in many cases are just as important for clinical care. You know, that you have integrity of data and that you have it available to people that use it. But when people think of security, they primarily think of it as securing the data so that it has privacy and confidentiality. Um, now we've come to realize that, you know, there are things which are in the laws and which are in compliance which are there to preserve privacy and confidentiality, and then there are some things in there which may or may not actually provide that. In addition, we have to look at the trade-offs between patient care and what is needed in research and patient care and other things versus what is in regulations, legislation, and other parts of compliance. There's great usefulness that can be done by people in the clinical and research space you know, versus what sometimes the compliance regulations or the security standards, especially if you deal with federal agencies which have increasingly been putting more and more burdens on us in terms of standards that we have to follow. They've been giving us data use agreements. They've been putting things into research grants and contracts. So we have to look at what the risks are and the trade-offs. And the trade-offs can be great in terms of what you know, clinicians and other people can provide. Um, and when we look at the risks, we have to look at what are real risks, what are the threats, and you know, what are just those things which are legal compliance. Now there are real risks, real threats, and I should tell you that every day we do see them. They're much less today at the medical school since what we did in the fall than they have been. When I first came into this position, there were computers that were compromised every day, including at the med school, including in clinical departments and clinics. And even after HIPAA went into effect, there would still be, on the order of several a week, computers in doctors' offices and clinics which were compromised. That number has come down drastically. And since the fall of 2010, that number has come down quite a bit. So some of the things that we put in may have seemed draconian, but they brought that down. And that's a good thing, because every time we have a security incident, including just somebody getting their computer infected with a virus, that's a potential breach that we have to notify on. And that means that we have to go out and do an investigation, we have to go out and do a risk analysis and report back to the HIPAA privacy office, the general counsel, and say, we do not believe that there was a disclosure of EPHI in this incident. And in many of those cases, there is EPHI, it's on the drive, and <clears throat> depending on the organization, some organizations place their burden of proof differently. They say, if there was a you know, piece of malicious software, if there, if there was an intrusion, a computer virus or uh, there are other classifications and taxonomies of malicious software, including worms and backdoors and such, they would often take the burden of proof to be, okay, well, we can't tell whether or not there was a disclosure. We may have to notify. We may have to declare a breach from a potential breach and notify. Typically, we have not done that. We have been able to rule those out. But every one of those things is a huge event and a huge nightmare and concern for general counsel, that they might have to notify potentially thousands of people. So it's good that we've brought that down to now where we only see an incident once a week or 
sometimes once every several weeks. But still, they can be, you know, potentially a big problem. So we've changed our name from information security to security assurance and compliance. We still do see hacking. We still do see intrusions and compromises. And, um, you know, in 2010, we took a number of steps. That's continuing today. And I'll talk a little bit about that. We also revised policies in the HIPAA era. What do you think that our major cause of having large uh, data breaches and notifications has been here at Yale? It's not generally hacking. It's not generally intrusions and compromises. Exactly. Lost, stolen computers, which is really low tech. You know, somebody leaves their laptop somewhere or somebody, you know, breaks in and steals their laptop. Often from people who get into, in, in, including secure clinical areas, but they manage to get in there and sometimes hide until after hours, then root through offices and take laptops. So that's the biggest problem. What do you think is the biggest potential problem when you look at electronics, uh, you know, online forms of information? And it's not really people getting into servers and getting data. It's generally misdirection of email, email containing EPHI, which is sent to the wrong people. Very similar to faxes. You know, there are a number of misdirected faxes that, that take place. So that's the biggest one in terms of the frequency, although the numbers there are fairly low. You know, generally you see just a few patients or, or one patient's name as opposed to spreadsheets or databases filled with EPHI. So I'm not going to go back into the whole history and saga of HIPAA and high tech, just that in 2003 we implemented privacy here at Yale. And primarily that was done through training. Uh, there were some forms, there were policies posted, and it was primarily voluntary compliance. In 2005, we did the same thing for security, and along with that came standards. Now, there were incremental standards after 2005 until we made some significant changes in 2010. Some of those were driven by external agencies. The VA, for example, uh, referring to the last talk, was a prime mover. And the VA required us to implement a FISMA certification for some areas covered by federal grants and contracts. And we did that. We brought in a third party which came in and did the certification accreditation. Uh, they also, in 2008 and 9, required VA um, data to be secured and researchers working with VA data to follow their security standards in many cases, which involved encrypting their hard drives and taking several other steps. We brought in a security product at that time, PGP whole disk encryption, installed it on Yale researchers who dealt with the VA at that time. Later on, that was then extended to other parties at Yale. Um, <clears throat> after the economic downfall of 2008, the US Congress was looking around to fund many projects. And one of them that they funded was electronic medical records, EHRs. In 2009, they uh, funded a bill called ARRA, American Reinvestment Recovery Act, which led to HIPAA, the High Tech Act. And as part of funding the electronic health record throughout the industry and providing subsidies and incentives for that, they also, because of the worry of people of having their medical information put online, strengthened HIPAA. In many cases, they made it much stronger. So in 2009, we looked at high tech and what it would actually require, what it encouraged, et cetera. And we made some proposed policy changes as well as some technical measures. And that went and socialized throughout the university, especially in those HIPAA covered components in 2009. And early in 2010, we began to uh, circulate proposed policies um, into the early summer of 2010. On August 17th of 2010, <clears throat> although a number of groups had been talking about adopting the new policies, and high tech was already in effect at that point, there was a seminal event, which I'm not going to go into here, but that event caused a lightning strike across the medical school and the HIPAA covered components. Sort of a second cultural revolution at Yale. We had had HIPAA, and that had permeated throughout the organization. But on August 17th, high tech really went across. And the university came up with several million dollars to go out across the HIPAA covered components and the rest of the medical school and some other components. And we went out, we hired teams, we hired um, over 30 people 
to come in on a temporary basis and sweep across the medical schools. At first, it was sort of driven and pulled by business managers, and then teams were just sent out to different departments to go out and address and remediate machines. And we took a step of technical measures on those machines, you know, which in some cases was a real culture shock. But it has had an effect to really reduce the number of intrusions and compromises that we've had. Now, it brought us a lot closer to the YNHH environment. YNHH has not had a completely you know, security event free uh, environment either. They've had lost stolen laptops. And I should tell you, we also have lost stolen desktops at Yale. Uh, Yale does, in some cases, have a problem with physical security. So we've had incidents. For example, the time that Annie Lee, uh, the police were investigating that at the Amistad building. Over in another building, a person had taken 15 desktops out of a building at Yale Medical School and loaded them into cars. Um, and some of those, about half of those, were actually YNHH computers as opposed to Yale computers. So we've worked with YNHH increasingly to synchronize our policies because we have a fluid community that works in both institutions. Um, we've done some crosswalks between our policies and procedures as well as our training so that they can be substituted for each other. And there's some major changes coming along which are going to tie us more tightly and bind us together. One of those is that we're going to share an electronic medical record through the EPIC system. And a lot of work has been going on to secure that system in the planning stages. There's also going to be a major clinical trials management system called Encore, which will also be managed by Yale and Yale New Haven Hospital. And most of those will actually be hosted at Yale New Haven Hospital system. Um, we work closely with both YNHHS and the VA, as well as some other organizations, and we participate in the AAMC. I was on an AAMC group which worked on creating a document and submitting it to the VA and other federal agencies, trying to get them to relax their rules for security, at least for research purposes, if not for clinical uh, contracts. And that went pretty far. But before that, the VA pretty much had a very strict FISMA-oriented, almost a DOD standard for their medical information. I'm glad to hear that a lot of that's being relaxed. And what we recommended that was that they should instead look at using HIPAA as the standard and bring those things to the level of HIPAA compliance. So I just want to point out that Yale does have policies on all different types of electronic media. However, it often doesn't have them specifically on different classes, and we'll go into what those are. So oftentimes we're asked whether or not it's allowable to do a certain thing using EPHI or to communicate with patients, et cetera. And while we don't have very specific policies, we have to extrapolate as well as sort of review the, the technology and see what type of controls it has in there for security, for example, encryption uh, and other network security controls. We have policies, for example, on email, which is you know, one of the few that we specifically point out, and sometimes we extrapolate that. But we have policies on data retention. We do have policies on encryption standards. And I should note that, at least in the past, we didn't always have a high degree of compliance with this. People often didn't use encryption, or they used their own encryption, um, which may or may not have met the standard and which was not specified. There's also rules for data uh, disposal and destruction. Um, in addition to how long you can keep it, as well as who can access it, who can you provide data to. Now, federal agencies where you obtain data from other groups, they will often have their own you know, restrictions. And usually these are spelled out in documents called DUAs, data usage agreements, as well as other types of agreements, such as MOUs. We call them BAs and MOOs, you know, like sheep and cows, um, as well as business associates agreements. Now, in most cases, you can transmit information with patients as long as you have consent. And we have consent forms here at Yale that are used for both clinical treatment uh, and communicating with patients as well as for research. One of the, the big areas at Yale where people have used for communicating has also been with portals. Um, that was not successful with YMG as much as it was at Yale New Haven Hospital where they've had a very successful patient portal. The Yale New Haven Hospital uses a system for communicating with patients as well as community doctors called Zixmail. We've looked into all kinds of secure messaging and uh, you know, I just want to say that right now there are multiple standards for encrypted email. There's two 
you know, main ones, SMIME and PGP, that are not in wide use <laughs> on the internet, and many minor standards. I don't know if you've ever used a site called Hushmail, where you can send secured mail with other people. Note that we do have policies on email, and we actually have a matrix which goes into who's allowed to send email to whom under what conditions. Um, not all institutions do this. Some of them have a strict no mail policy. Some of them have a much simpler one. We have become much more fine-grained into exactly under what conditions you can do that. We don't have specific policies for IM, for web chat, uh, SMS, Skype. We're now, uh, as of the new version, allowing it. And as of yesterday, you'll see that Microsoft has actually bought Skype. And uh, they're going to bring a new change to it. It has had security problems in the past, vulnerabilities. Um, it has a peer-to-peer -peer mode in it. And there's lots of web, you know, and other types of video and audio conferencing services out there, uh, such as WebEx and Adobe Connect, which people have used and have wanted to use here at Yale. This is a whole new class of communication with people. And there are people who've wanted to use this to re recruit research subjects as well as communicate with others. Uh, and people have been asking us about these sites all the time. I should just point out you know, that there are risks associated with these. So we had a group at Yale which wanted to uh, bring in people who were uh, you know, Muslim children at one point to talk with them and, and assure them. And we looked at a lot of the threats that were out there and worked on dealing with them. One thing is that there's actually a federal regulation called COPPA, C-O-P-P-A, which says that you have students who are 13 or under, you have to obtain their parents' permission for them to you know, participate in these uh, websites. Now that doesn't actually apply to nonprofits such as Yale. Some of the problems and the threats that we've seen in the past, these are oftentimes in the K through 12 group are harassment and bullying, which does take place on some social networks. Uh, intrusion and hijacking, which I spoke of before. Spamming and phishing are becoming a much greater problem on Facebook and other places, and I anticipate that we'll see a good bit of spam on Facebook and others. And uh, identity theft, which brings me to the next slide. So we do see identity theft. Uh, we have had cases here at Yale involving Yale people. Primarily we see it involved in financial identity theft or people that are using it for harassment. Um, we have not seen a great deal of medical identity theft, but it's out there. We've also seen a good bit of reputational risk. And this brings in other risks where if people do participate as healthcare consumers, you know, with different types of social media, including these new social media that we saw before, they can end up, you know, doing things in their youth with indiscretions that later could follow them if they show examples of alcohol and drug abuse, um, if they talk about diseases or medical treatments or mental or physical conditions. You know, sometimes that information stays around on these sites forever. So there are different types of reputational risk which could involve, you know, pre-existing conditions and getting insurance or future employment opportunities.